Uh, my name is Kaylee, and my pronouns are she, her. I am the Community Partnership Manager at Eating Recovery Center and Pathlight Mood and Anxiety Center. ERC Pathlight offers a full spectrum of treatment services for adults, adolescents, and children of all genders. We also offer free resources such as free virtual support groups like you're in right now, events, podcasts, and more for our community. We do have a lot planned for this next hour, so I want to quickly go over the guidelines. Um, and then Emma will also be pasting them in the chat throughout the hour just to keep this space um, a safe and supportive community within the chat. So our guidelines for this grief release workshop include, this is a workshop and is not therapy or a replacement for therapy. Please make sure you're being open and respectful. Remember, we all come from different backgrounds and life experiences. Honor confidentiality throughout the group. We encourage you to share in the chat as you feel comfortable and when responding to prompts from Joni, our facilitator, she'll be asking questions throughout um, this session and just feel free to put all of that in the chat. We also want to note that grief can be a very heavy topic. We encourage that you take care of yourself as needed. That can include but is not limited to stretching, getting a snack, getting some water, and potentially stepping away from the group for the day if you feel like the topic is, topic is getting a bit too heavy for you. Um, this is your journey, and it's okay to do what you need to do. Um, and definitely make plans for self-care after group um, while and while you're doing the assigned activities from Joni. So I'm so excited to get started um, with this group. I want to introduce you to week two of our grief release series with our facilitator, Joni Dwyer. And just as an FYI, we will be recording this group for later viewing. So if you or anyone you know who's meant to be here misses any of the sessions, they will be made available on demand at the end of the series. So please um, just keep an eye out for that. We'll also edit out any participant information. You won't see the chat in the recording, anything like that. And so you can be assured that what is happening in group will always stay in group. And with that, I will ask Joni to please share your screen and take it from here. Hi, everybody. I'm going to have to go find what I'm after. So hold on one second. I'm almost there. Hang in there with me. Let's see. There we are, believe it or not. There. Where am I and what am I doing? It is low pressure to do this in front of this many people, Joni. No worries. I think uh, if you just go back to your PowerPoint, um, it minimized for whatever reason. Did it? Okay. But go back, back to the PowerPoint app at the bottom. Okay. There. And then make that full screen. And I'm then you'll start the presentation from beginning. There's a little... Um, I don't know, kind of on the menu bar so you can see the it fills the whole screen. Is it showing up yet? Click, um, so there's like an auto save button and then across from that, you'll see a from beginning, click that button. All the way across. You got it. That's it? You did it. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Thanks for your patience. Um, welcome back. I'm so glad to see you all and uh, hope you had a good week. I had an interesting week. You know, I told you last week, I'm in the middle of walking through an ongoing grief with a diagnosis of cancer in, our, in somebody very dear to me in our family. And so um, all of this applies to me. Everything I'm going to say applies to me as well. So, and this is something I have, of course, known these tools for a long time. I've been working in this field for 20 years. And one of the things that I find so um, gratifying is that I can use these tools over and over and over in my life. Because when we are human beings, <laughs> 
we have life changes and challenges and hurts. And that means that the tools that you can use in this work from this workshop will help you in everything. Um, because everybody, if we're human beings, will have experiences that cause grief and loss. Some of them are caused by death. Some are caused by stress. There's so many different ways. And of course, we've talked about that and we'll talk about it some more. Um, but if we can learn some tools to walk through this kind of pain in our lives, we can then apply those anytime we have loss of any kind. And it's one of the things that I love about the, the practical information that we're sharing and we're going to share. So this will be some of the hardest work you've ever done and some of the most rewarding. Um, did you hear anything last week that was helpful or meaningful in that first class? Talk about that for a minute in the chat, would you? And then while you're doing that, let's talk about the homework. Uh, did you try the your record of loss? Did you attempt that? And if so, what was that like for you? Was, was it surprising? Was it overwhelming? Did you find anything that you hadn't thought of before? You know, it's important for us to just realize, oh my gosh, not only have I had loss, but look what I've lived through. Everybody here, everybody who is in this group is a survivor. That's the truth. We have all gone through a lot of different things that create resilience in us. But when we're hurting, we certainly don't feel resilient, do we? That's not the first thing we feel. Many times we just feel like I can't do this. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, and then there'll be someone who comes alongside us, right? Because the truth is, this is it's very hard to do by yourself. And the good news is you don't have to. That's why I love the resources that you have and the way you're working through this in your, port in your support. And that's what we're going to talk about this week as well. So what do you think about journaling? I know a lot of you are probably used to journaling. Uh, I know those prompts are um, can be really difficult when you start writing about something that touches your heart so, so completely. Uh, did you find yourself crying? Did you find yourself wanting to quit because it, it, it was too painful? You know, what was that like for you? And if you have any questions, just please put those in the chat because we're going to address those each week. And in fact, I'm gonna address last week's right now, if I may. Um, I was so taken with your vulnerability and your willingness to share. That was fantastic. How I, I appreciate that so much from being on this side. I appreciate it so much when, um, when the class is sharing at the level you're sharing. I can't tell you just what that's going to mean to you and everybody else in the class. So one of the things that someone talked about was that it, when you have multiple losses, and many of you have multiple losses going on, that it feels very much like post-traumatic stress syndrome, right? Or P PTSD. Well, the good news is it doesn't have to get to a disorder if you're processing it. You know, we all will have that, that post-traumatic stress after a trauma just the nature of the beast, but it doesn't have to get to a disorder when you can address it, talk about it, cry about it, feel it. And that's the, that's the good news because you're already doing that. You're doing that by showing up. So way to go. Uh, the other one was, could chronic pain come from loss? I don't know whether chronic pain can come from loss, but it certainly aggravates it. I know that for sure. Um, someone said, I'm angry and guilty for feeling so angry. Boy, we're going to talk about that today because we're going to talk about feelings. And um, in fact, we're going to get to that pretty quickly. So we'll address that. 
I love this one. Somebody said, I wish this were more linear. So there would be a timetable. Isn't that the truth? Oh my goodness. That would be great. If we could, if we could say, okay, it's going to take me two years and five months and then I'm going to be fine. Right. Um, it just doesn't work that way because our heart's involved, right? It would be one thing if our head, only our head was involved, but our hearts are involved because this is about feeling. And that's where all of those feelings live is in our heart. In fact, it, our limbic system is often referred to as our heart brain, right? We'll talk some more about that as well. So there is a, somebody else said, wouldn't it be nice if it was, it, it's a time warp. Not wouldn't it be nice, it is a time warp. And wouldn't it be great if it wasn't such a time warp when it comes to that? There's a, a poem that, a very sad poem that I love by Auden. And it's called Funeral Blues or Stop All the Clocks. And that's what it addresses. As my love has died, stop all the clocks. Stop the dogs from barking. Make the world stop moving, but it doesn't, does it? So that's a very normal feeling is that you're on a time warp. Um, I love this question. Somebody was talking about having adult children who still expected her to do everything and turn to her. And one of the things that's really important when we're in loss is that everybody affected by that loss is in their own loss, right? And because grief is so unique to each of us, it's so important that each of us have the help that we need. We cannot be everybody's counselor and especially our adult children. But what we can do is say, we are in this together. We are going to support each other. We are going to go through this together. We're going to stay close. We're going to show love to one another. And the way you can show love to me is go see this counselor and you hand them a name, right? You have a resource that you can hand to them or you say, please go find your counselor. Find someone to help you. I can't be your counselor, but I sure will help you find somebody to do that to do that because I need my own counseling in this and make it clear that that's how they can really help you and support you is by getting their own help. And then you can call around and find, you can feel free, find some counselors for them, find some resources for them and let them know what they are. Um, new losses will bring up old losses. That was a surprise to me that when I had a new loss, all of a sudden, I would be thinking of some loss that I had way in the past. Like, why am I thinking of, why am I thinking of Aunt Ruth right now? What the heck, where did that come from? That is standard in grief, that old losses will also bubble up to the surface. And all you do with that is just let it be whatever it is and miss Aunt Ruth if that's what comes up. Just... All you have to do is take one little baby step, be right where you are, right? It's like being in a mall. The sign says, you are here, you are here. You can't be anywhere else anyway. So just be and do that one little thing in front of you. It's baby steps. And you're in charge of that. You get to take a step and then you get to stop and look around and say, okay, am I okay? Am I safe? Do I need anything? Do I need to call somebody? What's going on, right? You get to do this. It's so often we feel so out of control in grief. And that's pretty standard. Of course, our feelings are going crazy. But we can take that little bit, pull back. If you need a break, take a break. If you need to stay in your jammies all day, stay in your jammies, right? But if that goes four and five, six days, now you're isolated. Now you, now you need to get out of your jammies. <laughs> get a shower, get up move around a little bit, call a friend, right? Reach out, reach out for help. Let somebody help you. One of the problems with getting help is that we're usually the ones giving help and it's difficult to receive it. And it is, it's humbling and it's difficult to do, but you give a gift to your people who love you when you ask them to help you, when you let them help you. So sometimes what I suggest is write down where you need help. Do you need somebody to mow the lawn? Make a list of the practical ways that your friends and family could help you. And so when somebody says, just call me, let me know what I can do, say yes and have something that they can do because it's a gift to them to get to help you. 
The other thing that that really stood out that I so appreciated the openness about toxic relationships. You know, we we barely touched on it last week, and I've got some more information for you this week. And in fact, I have a tool that I'm going to explain to you at the end today. Um, that is really helpful in this in these kinds of situations in particular. Whether you're the person who is toxic and you're working on yourself or whether you're the person who has been uh, the victim of somebody who's been toxic. So this tool is, is really going to be good. And I usually don't present it this week. I usually present it next week, but you guys are ahead of the game. So we're just going to go ahead and do that today. And we'll do that at the end of the presentation. Uh, one other thing was uh, feeling Joyful and guilty at the same time. This is really good. A lot of people, when they start feeling better, feel guilty. And they feel like they're forgetting. Well, here's the thing. That we will sometimes hold ourselves back from feeling better because we feel guilty. We feel like we're forgetting. We feel like we're not honoring. But here's the way I look at this. There's two things. One is I think about my husband dying. If I had died before him, I would want him to miss me for a little while, right? That makes sense. And then I would want him to have the best life he could possibly have because I loved him. I still love him because death does not end love and it doesn't end relationship, right? It changes it. It becomes a relationship of memory. I've relocated him someplace else in my heart, but I carry him with me all the time as I do many of the people who've passed my life that I, I love and have contributed to my life. So um, the other thing is that I, and I learned this, you know, a lot of the things that I have learned have been from Dr. Alan Wolfelt, a lot of training with him, who I think is, he would hate it, but he is an expert <laughs> in grief and loss, um, has done this work for 40 years. And uh, the other person is Joanne Petrie, who wrote the original grief release. Joanne is um, a hospice chaplain and a bereavement counselor in Portland, Oregon. And I had a uh, and and the people that I have taught over the years in this same class have taught me so much about their walk and what they need and what grief is. And one of the most wonderful things I heard one time was a father and son and they had the father had lost to his other son. And at the end of it, I said, what are you, what are you going to take with you? What do you want to put out in the world as a result of your loss? And the dad said, you know, my son was so kind that I'm going to be more kind and put kindness out in the world. And the brother said, he had such a sense of humor and I'm pretty serious. So I'm working on my sense of humor so I can honor him and his memory. Isn't that cool? That is a great way to remember people. But when you start feeling better, it's okay that you feel better. And um, one directly connected to something I experienced was that 10 days before my husband died, my first grandchild was born, my grandson, Sam. And um, I had this incredible joy with this baby. And I had on the other side, this incredible sadness from losing Chad. And what I discovered through that was that I could hold opposite feelings at the same time in my soul and that it was okay. So when I was joyful with that baby, I was full of joy. When I was sad, I was full of sad. Whatever it was, I just let it be what it was. You know, there's a lot more letting than getting when it comes to grief. And that's one of the things that's so hard for us to do is to let it be. Let, let yourself be sad if you're sad. It's okay. You don't have to make yourself be sad. Now I have to stay in my sadness. That's right. Let it be what it is. It will come and go. It will be a wave that washes over you. It'll wash back out if you will allow yourself to feel it. Same thing with joy. Let it be. Whatever you're feeling, feel it. Just try to stay in the present moment and be. Okay? And then one more and I'm done. <laughs> guided journal. Somebody asked if there was a guided journal. 
my favorite is Alan Wolfell. So he has an understanding your grief book and an understanding your grief journal that are both excellent. And if you go to his website, it's A-L-A-N-W-O-L-F-E-L-T uh, and go to his bookstore and you can order it online. But those are the, that one is outstanding. So if there's any other questions, just go ahead and ask them. Let's talk one more time. I want to do this definition so we're all on the same page. Loss. Loss is when someone or something we care about is threatened, harmed, or taken away, right? Grief is the way we feel and think when that happens. And mourning or grief work is the outward expression of our feelings and thoughts that we experience when we have loss. So to be, oh, sorry. I'll get it any minute now. <laughs> to be human means loss is going to occur, that grief is normal and necessary, right? It's a part of our healing. It is the path that we follow to heal. Uh, it's unique and often complex. Our ability to grieve is based on our ability to attach. So it's very much connected to love. Sometimes it's connected to, and we touched on a little bit last, last week, we can be attached to somebody who's toxic. And then we wind up grieving what we missed, what we didn't get, what we don't have a chance to, to make right. And we'll talk more about that as we get to the end of this series. Life is a series of transitions, right? We often have to give up something to get something else. There's this liminal space experience in grief. Liminal space is the space in between. And there are so many times that I, it, grief feels like you are caught in limbo and you can't get out of it. And as human beings, we hate that. <laughs> this is not a place we like to live. And so it's a lot of times one of the reasons that we are we're, we avoid pain is because we're just trying to make it better. We just want that pain to go away a little bit. Um, the hard part is we have to live there for a while when we're in grief. When we're working through things, it is liminal space. Um, there's a, a professor at Whitworth University over in Spokane, Washington. Jerry Sitzer is his name, and, and he's written a couple of, he's written eight books actually. Um, but one in particular called um, The Grace of Grief. And he talks about liminal space and he said, I long for what I had and I hope for what will come. And that he was living in that space and that that was difficult. He had lost three family members in a car accident where he was driving and they got hit head on with a drunk, by a drunk driver. Um. And so it's that space. It reminds me, the feeling reminds me of there are times when I'm I'm on a river fly fishing and I'm going to walk across these rocks and I've got hold of a branch and I'm holding onto this branch and I'm stepping across these rocks so I don't fall in the river. And there's a branch, but it's just out of reach. And I can I can see it and I can almost reach it, but in order to get it, I'm going to have to let go of this branch to get this one. And it's that space in between that's liminal space. Um, so many times that's what we'll feel is that we just hate being in that space, but that's where we are when we're in grief. And if you just keep putting one little foot in front of the other, you'll get through, you really will. So we need to find healthy people with whom we can feel safe and process our grief. So it can become authentic mourning. That's what we're after. So let's talk about some myths about grief. Time alone heals grief. No, it doesn't. Boy, I wish it did. If it did, that 20 years between my father dying and me working through the effect of, of his death on me, um, if it was going to happen, I would have found it by then. But time alone won't. But time and grief work will. 
grief work. This is a big old overview of what that word can mean, right? To learn about grief and loss, acknowledge the loss, face the pain, recognize and honor and process our thoughts and feelings, embrace a new reality, find a new identity, search for hope and find meaning and purpose again. That's a, that's a very big overview. <laughs> I love this. John Dunn wrote, he who has no time to mourn has no time to heal. Isn't that good? If I avoid these awful feelings, they'll go away. There's a myth. Because unacknowledged or avoided feelings won't disappear. They stay in our hearts and minds. And they create unrest, to put it mildly. They also interfere with relationships like crazy. Because it interferes with a relationship with us. The relationship we have with ourselves is the one we're going to have with everybody else. That's why when you work on the relationship with yourself, you'll see that health spread into your other relationships. So we need to befriend the pain of grief so our hearts and minds can heal. That's what we're working on. And there's no painless way to do this. Well, I wish there, I wish there was, but there isn't. And again, there are so many things. The thing that has helped me is to look back on the things that I've come through where I have been in pain and I have not only survived, but I have come to a place where I have a thriving life and I feel fully alive in my life. I never thought that could happen with the level of grief that I've had but here I am. And it's just, it's not one of those things where, um, <laughs> it's not one of those things where you can keep checking in with yourself. Am I there? Am I there? You just sort of find yourself there sometimes simply by doing the work, the simplicity of putting again, one little foot in front of the other, right? Did I tell you about my aunt last week? This reminds me of her. Um, it was my favorite aunt Jewel. And she loved gardening and she would plant a million flowers every spring, but she just couldn't stand it. And she'd go dig them up every so often to see if they were rooting. Right? <laughs> and a lot of times that's what we do to ourselves. We keep analyzing ourselves. Am I getting there? Is it right? It's like, breathe, be kind, have some compassion for yourselves. Let it be. Just pick a healthy path and take one step. Yeah. Okay. You can do this. Myth, I need to do this on my own. Boy, that's not true. I tried that for 20 years too. Hmm, didn't work. Our grief needs to be witnessed, right? Often grief comes to us via relationship and we are going to heal in relationship. That's really important right there. Okay. I can't do this. Boy, did I feel that. You guys ever feel that? I can't do this. This is too big. I have screamed this many times. You can, if you understand what you're going through really helps. And if you can gain some processing skills, it makes all the difference. You can, if you'll allow other people to help you. Again, you've already done hard things. You can do hard things. I love this line. We are all made of strength and struggle. Isn't that good? That's Brene Brown. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to go over this again. Expectations, dreams, and our actual life. This is where all of that grief and pain is right in here. Because these two don't reconcile. And the thing that reconciles them is coming to a place of acceptance. Not when everything becomes okay. It's reconciling that my expectations and my actual life don't match. And I need to stop fighting that and come to a place that I can say, all right, it is what it is. And there's got to be a way through. And you know why you know this? Because you have come to this place over and over and over in your life, or you wouldn't be here. You've already done this. You know how to do this. But it's you have to work through this you know if if you could just come to it it would be great but it's actually all the work that you do in here around grief and loss is what reconciles these two things so we can embrace a new reality in our life 
a new way of being, a new way of walking around on this earth. So let's talk about feelings, because goodness gracious, no, come back here, feelings. There you are. Um, our, our ability to share our emotions is paramount to our success in processing grief. Does that make sense? Yeah, we need to be able to move our feelings outside ourselves in a way that doesn't hurt us or somebody else, right? We need to be able to express it. So they're housed in our limbic system. Our limbic system is in our amygdala, which is pretty close to our brain stem. It's tucked way up under our brain to keep it as safe as possible because it's our survival brain, right? It is our meat brain, our lizard brain. It's called so many different things. And it is all experiential. Everything in that system is experiential. All of the feelings, right? Um, and so that's the place where our reaction, when we are in our limbic system, when that's taken over our bodies uh, and our minds, that we are going to fight freeze, or what? Freeze, fight, or flee, right? We're going to run away, depending on what the circumstances are. Now, this is really a beautiful system for us because when there is something we need to run from, we our brain needs to go, get out of here, go, right? This is... Our feelings, so many times we think of them as bad. No, no, I've got to get away from them. I've got to stuff them, get away from them. But man, those, they give us messages. They're neither good nor bad. They give us messages. Don't touch, run. Don't get out in traffic. Don't turn left yet. There are so many things that we get through our limbic system, through our feelings. But when they take over us, right? or when we completely ignore them and want to just stuff them and have them go away. Remember, the goal is, here's your rational mind, here's your emotional mind, in the middle is your wise mind. We want full access to our rational thinking, and we want full access to our feelings, so we can get into our wise mind. And the, the thing about feelings is, it's not that they're right or wrong, but how we respond or react to them can be, you know, we've all been around an angry person. And I don't mean just somebody feeling angry, but an angry person, right? That's when they just act angry all the time. You just want to get out of their way, don't you? Yeah. We're going to have a specific conversation next week on anger, by the way. And talk about how to work, how to handle that emotion and how to hand it in, handle it in other people. But how we respond or react to our feelings can be good or bad. So feelings are automatic. They just show up. So that addresses that I feel, when I feel better, I feel guilty. When I feel mad, I feel guilty, right? We're going to talk about that because uh, the feelings are automatic. You don't make yourself angry. Anger just shows up. And if you didn't grow up in a household that said it was okay to be angry and here's some healthy ways to, to process your anger, right? You can be angry, don't hit your sister, but you can't hit your sister. That's a good way to look at it. Feeling it and responding to it are two different things. This is what, what those two things mean, right? They're neither good nor bad, but the response or reaction can be. Um, I did the same thing with anger because I grew up in a family where just anger wasn't demonstrated. Everybody was very calm in my family, it seemed, except me and my brother. <laughs> and so I was angry with him a lot. And, uh, but I felt guilty about all that being angry. So what I did was I had this gigantic guilt bucket inside of me. And if I got mad, I would think, oh, I shouldn't feel angry, right? I didn't know they just show up automatically and they're not right or wrong. I had any feeling I didn't like like that was I was wrong. There was something wrong with me. And so I put everything into this giant angry bucket most of my life and felt bad for my feelings. Not most, but my young life, I certainly did. And I could have said, hi, my name is Joni and I'm sorry. 
And I just felt so, so much guilt. Everything went into guilt because I didn't know how to process my feelings. So we'll talk about how to do that as well. So they're automatic. They just show up. They can be frightening because we feel overwhelmed and out of control. And um, the thing that's that's counterintuitive is we think if we stuff our feelings that we're we are now in control of them. And it is truly the opposite. We stuff our feelings and they will stack up, stack up, stack up. Somebody steps on our last nerve and we blow. Okay. Right? Then we're out of control. So it's the it is counterintuitive that if you will find ways, healthy ways to process your feelings that you will find yourself in control of your feelings, much more in control of them and in your wise mind. And you'll be able to choose a responsive set of reaction. Now, you are not going to be able to do this all the time. We are not looking for perfection here. We are looking for progress. Okay? Um, all right. So what do we need to do with these things, these feelings? Accept them as valuable instead of trying to get away from them all the time. Be able to identify your feelings, name them, right? Big difference. If I had said to my husband, if I was slamming doors and he said, what's wrong? And I said, nothing, right? <laughs> well, he knew to stay away from me for sure, but it didn't solve anything. And I didn't feel any better. But if he said to me, what's wrong? And I said, I'm, I'm mad at you. You know what he'd say to me? Why are you mad at me? And then we could have a conversation. And I must tell you, uh, it, I won't save this for next week with anger, but what I would do is when I was in conversation with him and I would feel myself getting mad, I would say, hold on, I have to go to the bathroom. And he'd say, now? And I'd say, yes. And I would go in the bathroom and lean on the sink and breathe. Just cool down, right? Calm myself down. That's one of the things that is helpful. Breathe, breathe, your, breathe. Give yourself a chance, back off. If I came back, found myself getting mad again, because you know, when you're in conversation, we'll talk about this next week, and, and you start getting mad, that is going to be the end of anything valuable going on, because then it becomes a competition, and you say things you don't mean, it's not good, not good. So we'll talk about how to hand, handle anger in particular next week. But we've got to be able to identify. I feel mad. I feel sad. I feel happy. Put a label on them, right? And you can do that with journaling. I use journaling a lot for that. I will write down, what am I mad about? You know, if I'm driving along cussing at the guy in front of me, it's like, wow, I'm mad about something. What is it? I go home, I get out a piece of paper and I write down, what am I mad about? And then I just go look for it. And it's amazing when I find it's like, I'm mad because I have to clean the garage. Well, yeah, because Chad died and that's his job, not my job, right? It will, these things don't have to be rational. It just will, it'll just show up, right? But you can find it. And once you find it, it can dissipate. It's so cool when you're able to do this. So we need to find some healthy ways to express them, huh? So um, breathe, know what they are, uh, calm yourself down, maybe you need to take a break, timing is everything, don't try to have a conversation when you are furious, doesn't work, it's not going to go well, um, you've got to have, you're going to talk to somebody, the timing for them is super important too, right? I used to want to have a conversation with my husband about mm, 10 o'clock at night. And he woke up at four. It was his favorite. He loved mornings. And that was one thing we were different about. Um, and so that was that never went well. So I finally realized, oh, timing is really important when I'm going to have a conversation about how I'm feeling. Okay. Sometimes I just need somebody to say it out loud. That's where journaling helps. And and in just a second, we're going to talk about that. Recognizing how my feelings are triggered. That's another really important thing, right? And see if I can figure out another way to respond to them. For example, if I'm overwhelmed, I love this. Halt, H-A-L-T. Am I too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? That's really a helpful thing for me to think about. 
when I'm overreacting, it's like, did I eat lunch? Wait a minute. Okay. Um, is there an old hurt that needs to be addressed? Sometimes feelings will keep popping up because of something else. Have you guys been through this before where you, you're in a relationship and somebody says something and it sounds like something you heard someplace else in your life that hurt you? An experience that you had with somebody else and you overlay that person that you have broken up with or that was mean to you or whatever, you overlay it onto this person as if they're just like that because it's the same word and it's the same feeling you got triggered. Yeah, so that's important to realize because there are times that people will say, I did this, I said this, and, and he said, I'm not your dad, right? Because we often do that with our feelings, right? Our feelings don't have to make sense. That's what our brain's for. That's what our linear part of our brain is for. So it's important to realize that feelings are not facts. They may show us the facts, but they give us other information about, sometimes the information is about something in us that needs to heal an old hurt that needs to be addressed, okay? Oh, vulnerability allows authenticity. Good old vulnerability. I'm telling you, just looking at the chat last week, you guys are so vulnerable. Thank you so much. You're amazing, truly. Um, because it's neither feminine or masculine, it's human. A lot of times when I ask the question, what do you guys think of vulnerability? In class, it'll be, uh-uh, that'll get you killed, right? I love the way Bre Brene Brown says, uh, vulnerability is show up and be seen even when you can't control the outcome. Isn't that good? Ooh, that kind of says it. But here's the deal. This is not go spill your guts to everybody. That is not what that's about. Vulnerability is finding people that you trust. You check it out first, right? Go slowly. It's okay. We've all been with people who overshare too fast. And we've been with people who won't share anything, right? Right. Either one of those, sometimes people will overshare because they expect to get hurt, so they want to get it over with. And then they can back off. Um, and sometimes we overshare because we're in so much pain, we can't help it. And I know that that was true for me when, when, I'm, when I'm in grief, I have to watch out because I'll overshare because I'm pretty open. So I have to go a little more slowly. Yeah. But it... But authenticity, man, to get to be who you are. You know, when we talk about recovery, whatever kind of recovery, grief recovery, addiction recovery, whatever it may be, we're just becoming more and more of who we're supposed to be in the first place. We're becoming more whole. We're becoming more of, of who we truly are. I love that. And I've experienced that in my life. I think we are constantly becoming right? Even at my age, I'm still becoming, and I will be becoming until probably 20 minutes after I die. You know, I mean, it's just, this is living. And what an adventure, right? There's this little bitty tweak between excitement and fear, little tiny tweak. And so, so much of it has to do with perspective, right? And how we see things. So this being willing to expose personal needs is biggie when it comes to vulnerability. You can't have relationship without being vulnerable. There's no way, right? Intimacy is see into me. I let you see into me, right? That, that's what connects us. We are wired for relationship, truly. We are biologically wired for relationship. So admitting your own limitations and mistakes, having a teachable spirit, you know, vulnerability allows us to just be and breathe. Being reluctant to appear the expert or the answer person, the final voice of authority. Most of us have been an answer person, are an answer person for somebody. It's that's the way that's the way it is, right? But we don't have to, we don't have to live with a facade 
of, I can't let you know who I am because then you'll see I'm just a human being. Yeah. Embrace your humanity. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. So let's see. Let's talk about support systems. How are you guys set for your support system? Do you have, do you have some people? I know you have some people <laughs> for sure because you're with Pathlight, you have people to, wow, what a gift. So here's what, here's what a, a support system looks like. It consists of a network of people who've committed themselves to lend a hand in practical ways, right? So you want to recruit people who are patient, discreet, available, trusted, honest, and sincere, right? You want healthy people on your side. Um, and you can't just depend on one person. And the reason is, you know, some of us are extroverts and we have a lot of people. Some of us are introverts and we only need two, right? Um, but the problem is when you just have one or two people, they do annoying things like go on vacation and they're not available when you need them. And so it's really important if somebody says to you, do you need help? Say yes, right? Figure out something. Uh, it can be, and then make some plan. Can we have coffee on Thursday? Because you need to be able to talk, right? Here's what a support wheel looks like. You know, we talk about support and then it's like, well, what exactly does that mean? What do I actually need? Well, we need someone where you can talk about your loss, someone who's safe, trustworthy, and healthy, someone who can answer questions, someone who makes me feel loved. Yeah. Someone I can have fun with. Someone who gives me direct, honest, and supportive feedback, right? Somebody who helps me feel good about myself. Someone who listens while I talk about how I feel. And someone I can count on. It's a really good idea to write some of these things down and then write a name next to them of the person who fulfills that for you. Right? Maybe it's your support group. Maybe it's that it's broad like that. Maybe it's individuals. I needed somebody who could also kick me in the fanny when I needed to. And so I had two best friends in particular, and one of them would give me a hug and the other one would give me a kick. And so depending on what I needed, I would call one or the other. And that was great. It was great to have that, that kind of honesty. I needed that kind of honesty in my life. But I also needed a lot of compassion and a lot of patience. And they both gave me that. I'm so grateful. They walked through some really hard times with me and helped my heart heal. So this, this is really important stuff here. So what are we going to do? Well, we need to talk. Talking is important in grief because, oops, it needs to be witnessed, right? I read this great article in Psychology Today. I was looking for why is it that talking and writing this journaling idea, writing is so helpful. And this is what I found out. The studies showed that the action of telling your story turns off the stress response in your brain and turns on your relaxation response. Isn't that cool? And then it releases hormones like oxytocin, uh, dopamine and, and endorphins, right? That knowing that really helped me step up and start talking more and start sharing at uh, a different level. So the question is, yeah, but who do I talk to, right? This is a question that comes up all the time in class. Who do I talk to? Well, one is yourself, kindly, please, right? Treasured friend, <laughs> be a treasured friend to yourself. Good, healthy friends, God, ministers, pastors, priests, professionals. If your loved one died, talk to them. It's fine. I hear people say, okay, you may think I'm crazy, but I'm talking to my husband who died. And it's like, well, no, that's not crazy at all. Talk to them. Talk to your pet. Great listeners. It's great that pets can't talk. <laughs> um, when it seems like no one wants to listen, keep searching. Find someone. Call a counselor. Someone you can tell your story to, tell your secrets to, right? It's great if you have a counselor because they're sworn to secrecy. It's perfect. Um, there's a, there's a saying 
that our secrets keep us sick. And, and that is true. That is very true. We need somebody that we feel safe with that we can that we can tell our secrets to. And it will help us heal truly. <laughs> tell your story and talk about your pain as often as possible. Right? So sometimes someone will call me and say, I need to go for a walk and tell you my story. And I'll say, well, how much time will you need? Well, I'm going to need about two hours. Okay, well, let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk and we'll do that. And then we'll have lunch afterward. Right? And then we'll just go and do that. Uh, I had someone in class and she said, I have no one, no one to talk to. And so the way she remedied that was she rode a bus every day. And when somebody would sit down, she would tell her story to the person sitting there. She said, I only had one person get up and walk off. <laughs> and then another one said, oh, I go to the mall and I sit on a bench and wait for somebody to sit down. Because sometimes it's easier to talk to a stranger than it is somebody we know, right? I mean, think of how many amazing conversations you've had on airplanes with total strangers. That's where that usually happens for me. But talk, find somebody to talk to and keep writing if that's helping you, right? Get it out of, it's, my friend says, either comes out of here or out of here. We need to get it out of you and tell your story. So let's talk about some practical tips for self-care. You know, we know all of this stuff, but it's always a good reminder. Selective TV and screen time consumption. That's really important when you're in grief. It's important anyway, but it's really important when you're in grief. Good health habits. Exercise. Eat well. Sleep, rest, play. Avoid isolation. Avoid self-destructive behavior. And sometimes massage is really good can be a really good thing to do for self-care, right? Um, anything that helps you take your foot off the gas for a while is helpful, right? And you can incorporate this into the talking thing, right? Exercise, take a friend, go for a walk. Have somebody you meet with to do your exercise. Um whether you're going to the gym, whether you're just getting outside, whatever that may be, see if you can see if you can create a way that you can do that. Um, I have friends and they get together and they cook for each other once a month. I love that idea. I haven't joined them yet, but I love that idea. I think I love the idea of somebody cooking for me more than <laughs> that's really what that's done. But that's really good right there. Sleep and rest. I don't know about you, but this is hard for me to do. It's hard for me to stop and rest. I'm not a person who's really good at taking a nap. I just keep, I, I, I seem to be in perpetual motion. So I have to really work on this, like turn off the TV and go to bed, right? Um, play. I don't have a hard time playing. <laughs> I realized Finally, years ago, I used to think life had to be a struggle. When I was in my 30s, it was really important. Everything was a struggle. Everything was hard. If it wasn't hard, it wasn't worth doing. Ooh, my poor little, poor little thing. I have such compassion for my young self. And then I realized, oh my gosh, when I play, it fills up my bucket. Oh my goodness, it refreshes me and it fills me back up and I'm ready to go. So I have, I have become very proficient at playing. <laughs> and figuring out what would be fun. I live in a place where it gets cold and snowy in the wintertime. And so when winter starts coming, I start thinking of what am I going to do this winter? What am I going to do that's fun? And um, usually what I do is I pick something to learn every winter. This winter is going to be pottery. And I've got two friends who want to go take pottery classes with me. So that's how I figure out what I want to do is I decide, hmm, last year I was going to learn French. I never did it because I don't really want to. I've decided <laughs> that was that was like too much work and not fun. So I had to I had to figure out something else for this winter. Avoid isolation. Boy, isolation, honestly, that is the thing that will stop us in our tracks because it leaves us stuck in 
a lot of emotions that may be off and we don't realize that, that our thinking is off in those. And next week I'm going to, we're going to talk about this, about the way we're thinking and our perception of things. But that isolation piece is big. If you see yourself isolating, please step out of it. Call somebody and say, I'm isolating. What can I do? Help me. That's all you have to do. Okay. Avoid self-destructive behaviors. Whew. This is, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's my go-to. I am going to go to that pantry. Give me stress. I'm going to walk to the pantry. It just happens. And so if I can give myself a moment when I get there and simply say, what's going on? What are you afraid of? What are you feeling sad about? It's usually fear that drives me there, honestly, for me. And it's that piece of talking to myself as a friend, because if my friend said, look, you're going to have to help me out on this. Those are the questions I'd ask her. What's going on? Uh, how do you feel? And just have some conversation about it. So, and massage. I'm going to put that one on my list too. That's a good one. Because a lot of times what we're missing, especially in a relationship, when we lose somebody, is we're missing being touched. Right? So we want to find a way, a healthy way, an appropriate way to be touched. Because one of the things that's really common in grief is to go toward promiscuity. And the reason is because we need to be touched, especially if that's really important to us. So massage is a wonderful way. Hug somebody because you get a hug back when you hug, right? Um, so that's, pay attention to that. Here's some more ways. We need to express encouragement to ourselves. Um, I used to... I would call myself and leave a voicemail for myself to encourage myself. And then I would totally forget that I did it. And I would, oh yeah, and I would hit the button and it would say something like, your hair looks good today, way to go, way to hang in there, right? And it would crack me up. So I it, that's how I encouraged myself. Express encouragement to other people. That helps too. Sometimes it helps to get out of ourselves and do this for other people. Embrace hope and courage because let me tell you, you've got courage. You got here. You are full of courage. Courage is not a feeling. Courage is doing something in spite of the fear. And that's what you're doing. And the more you do that, the more hope you will have because you can see, I am overcoming this. This is happening. Yeah, little by little by little. All you want is little tiny movement. That's all we need, just a little movement. Resolve or improve your relationship with God if that's applicable for you, right? If you have uh, faith, lean on it. Let that help you. Practice forgiveness. This is a biggie. Again, we're going to talk about this in particular next week. Keep your sense of humor. When I know that I'm getting way too serious, I will go see one of my favorite movies. I'll find it online and go see, um, I will pull up Young Frankenstein because it cracks me up. Yeah. So think of a movie that makes you laugh and watch that movie. Have some laughter in your life. Embrace the possibility that there's still much life to live. You know, there was a long time in my grief that I could not embrace that. But I could say, okay, well, other people have found that maybe I can too, right? Borrow your hope from somebody else in that. Treat yourself like a treasured friend. You getting tired of me saying that? Hmm? I'll just keep it up. Um, and have an attitude of gratitude. Okay, gratitude. We hear it all the time. But man, the studies on what gratitude does for us is phenomenal. And that's going to be part of your homework this week. Okay. Um, what we want to do is you're going to write five things a day that you're grateful for without repeating any of them. Right. So that means if you don't write family, write down the names of your family or they're gone. You know, you've already done it. So 
you have to find something else. I've done this until I'm down to toothpaste, toothbrush, right? Look for those things that you're grateful for that uh, we usually overlook in our lives. Talk to somebody this week, right? Continue journaling if that helps you. And so quickly, I'm going to take you through ritual. This. Tony. Yeah. There's, um, we are uh, at time and not wanting to go too far over. And I know rituals is such an important conversation. Um, And I'm wondering if we need to save it for next week. Let's do. Let's do it because this is, this is so important. Yes. 100%. I really want to be able to spend the time on it. Okay. Sounds good. Let's do that. Can you go back to the homework slide? And everyone, um, if you could just take a screenshot with your phone, if that would be helpful so that you have it. Um, because we need to go to a final slide as well. Okay. Is there anything else you wanted to say about homework, Joni? Uh Again, if you can't do it and it's and it's too hard for you, don't do it, right? If it doesn't help you, don't do it. That's the purpose of it. But if you can, I think especially a gratitude list can be really, really helpful. See what you think of it. Okay? Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Oh, Joni, this was such a powerful week. The chat was pretty on fire. Um, mm. There was so much going on, so much support that we were seeing um, toward each other. It was beautiful. Um, we have some, I think, very important questions that kind of floated to the top as far as some general questions that um, we'd love to cover likely next week so that we can really honor everyone's time. So we'll make sure to send the chat to Joni so she can noodle on the questions that you've all asked. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, but this was just such a powerful week. I think it's, you know, just the introduction of emotions can be very emotional. So thank yes. you. You're welcome. Thank you. See you next week, everybody. Thanks so much, Joni. Mm-hmm.